Hey church, happy Sunday. Just a quick little stewardship note for you. As you know, we're in the middle of stewardship season, which will go until May 17th. And if you haven't mailed your pledge card in already, there's a little bit of a delay with those pledge cards forwarding to our financial administrator. So just to make sure that we get everything on time, it's okay to still mail in your pledge card if that's the method you prefer. But actually, it's so easy. Just go on our website, and on the home page, there's a little box that says Make a Pledge, and you can click on that and put your pledge information in that way. Super simple. Just so you know, we still have about 150 pledges that we need in order to meet our goal and 30 new households that didn't pledge last year to pledge this year. So we encourage you to just jump online, go to our website, click on Make a Pledge, and that's the easiest way to let us know your pledge for this year. Our little choir is ready to sing the intro for us as we worship today, so let us join them. Friends, welcome to worship at Claremont United Church of Christ. Thank you for tuning in. It is so encouraging to see week after week how many of you are joining us on our live stream and on our Facebook channel. Thank you for giving regularly each week online. Thank you for checking in with each other. Thank you for being Christ's hands and feet during this difficult and challenging time. We are truly embracing what it means to be the church and to be adaptable in any circumstance. Please join me in a call to worship. It will come up on your screen. As people of faith, we share a vision. We, we will come, come together, together and worship, worship our God. God. We will proclaim good news to the poor and freedom to the captives. We, we will, will share in our triumphs and failures. We will witness to one another the power of God's love and grace. We will share our resources with one another and those in need, speak out against injustice, and work for peace. God is casting a beautiful vision for our future. We will respond by working to make it a reality. Let us worship our Creator. Please join us in singing a hymn, Come, O Spirit, dwell among us, verses 1 and 3. They will come up on your screen.
Friends, as we prepare to continue our worship, I want to remind you that it is the first Sunday of the month, and so we are going to do communion together. So if you haven't already, I invite you to go into your pantry or your cupboards and grab something to eat and something to drink. We will be doing communion together a little bit later in the service. At this time, I invite you to open up your hearts and minds to make yourself known before our God as we join together in our prayer of confession. God who dreams big, when we believe our goodness to be greater than it is, forgive us. When we believe our sin is insignificant and manageable on our own, forgive us. When we fail to share your good news with friends and strangers alike, forgive us. Remind us once again, your resurrection is good news for all and renew in us a better vision for the future. Amen. Friends, we are not perfect, but we do worship a perfect God. For our missteps, we are released in grace. Let us receive God's mercy. Amen. Amen. All right, it's time to pass the peace to each other, so we're just going to do a quick review of all of the great ways we have to pass the peace. Of course, we have our holy elbow bump, and then our holy bow, and then, what was it, Jen? I'm forgetting already. Uh, we did the holy, peace, the holy signs. peace signs. Throw them. And then we taught you how to say hello in American Sign Language like this. Please pass the peace in our comments on Facebook Live as we're watching with each other. I am really enjoying the chance to watch with everyone and share the peace with all of you. After that, we did the holy sup nod. What's up? And then the jazz hands, followed by the tip of the hat. And then we did the air, air kisses. kisses. And then Spock, live long and prosper. And then finally, last week, we added the curtsy, milady. And today, our new one for you, for all of those fans of The Office out there, you've got to do the Jim Pam air high five from across the room. All right. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Please share the peace with one another, friends. Peace be with you, friends. <laughs> Hello again to all our young friends out there. We have a special message for you about this clock. Yeah, I have this clock here that I drew. And it looks like a pretty good clock to me. It's got all the numbers, 1 through 12, those of you who know how to tell time. It's got a center. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But it is missing, it's missing something. something rather important. Do you know what it's uh, missing? It has no hands on it. How can you tell the hour or the minute? It's true. This clock is missing the two hands. Usually one is long and one is short. And that is what helps us tell time on clocks, but I did that on purpose because I thought these days it's important to not care so much about the time, but to think about the fact that each moment we are living is now. And so no matter what time of day it is, we are living right now. And no matter what time of day it is, God is with us in every moment. So let's take a, a moment today and think about just living in the present and knowing that God is with us all day, every day, every minute, every second, no matter what time it is. Yeah, I bet some of your tall friends get confused sometimes exactly what time it is. Maybe Monday feels like Tuesday, feels like Wednesday, feels like Thursday, and it's hard to know what time it is. But we are thankful that right now, God is with us. Will you say a prayer with us? Dear God, thank you for giving us time to reflect on the fact that you are with us at all times. Help us to live in the present. And let all God's people say, Amen. Amen. We'll see you next time. Friends, as we prepare to make our offering this morning, I remind you that we are in stewardship season. And so we are going to hear from another member of the church what the church means to this person and why they choose to give. Let's watch. Hi, my name is Travis Long, and I attend CUCC with my wife, Tricia, and our two kids, Sawyer and Amelie. 
We've been attending CUC for the past two years and feel extremely blessed to have found this church community. The topic of tithing is an important one to us because we feel as churchgoers and Christians, we're called to give. But uh, if I think of CUCC and uh, church in general, churches are free to attend. Uh, if they charged, I would certainly pay money to go to CUCC. I love it there. We have a great group of uh, people who are part of our community. Our kids love it. They have a great group that they attend in Sunday school, loving teachers. Uh, we get so much out of Sunday mornings and miss it right now for sure, although online is great. Um, and just feel that the mission of the church, the focus, what is important to them, uh, their drive to include everyone and extend God's love to uh, the marginalized and those who are suffering um, is just right up our alley and something that as individuals and uh, people in the world we're striving to, to emulate and of course uh, we have to have a community to do that so by tithing and making this church a priority um, we feel like we are uh, helping in a small way but something that at least is uh, a step in the right direction. Thank you for that meaningful message. A reminder that there is information on your screen about how you can give online and how you can turn in a pledge, which is so important to the ministry of this church. If you have any questions, we invite you to email finance at claremontucc.org. That goes to our financial administrator, Jocelyn. She'd be happy to walk you through those steps or visit our website where you'll find all of that information. Thank you again for giving, for pledging, for being a part of the ongoing ministry and mission of this church, Claremont United Church of Christ. We thank you.
Please join me in a prayer of dedication. We make our offering today, O God, with gratitude for the past and great hope for the future. Amen. Our scripture reading is from the New Testament book of Acts, chapter 16, verses 9 through 15. During the night, Paul had a vision. There stood a man of Macedonia pleading with him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. When Paul had seen the vision, he immediately tried to cross over to Macedonia, being convinced that God had called us to proclaim the good news to them. We set sail from Troas and took a straight course to Samothrace the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia in a Roman colony. We remained in this city for some days. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate by the river, where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had gathered there. A certain woman named Lydia, a worshiper of God, was listening to us. She was from the city of Thyatira and a dealer in purple cloth. The Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what was said by Paul. When she and her household were baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come and stay at my home. And she prevailed upon us. Because of the coronavirus, I will never be able to understand the Holy Spirit in the same way again. It used to be that I thought the Bible's imagery to describe the Spirit of God was so beautiful. In Hebrew, the word is ruach, and in Greek, pneuma or pnevma. And these words, they translate not just to spirit, but also to wind or breath. And just as you can't see the wind or someone's breath, it's always there moving and circulating about the world, so too, even though we can't see God's Spirit, is always among us. The ultimate image of the Holy Spirit, of course, is in the creation story of Genesis, where God creates the first human and then breathes into it to give us life. I used to love that story. The divine breath is within us. Every time we take a breath, it is a reminder of the divine within us. Beautiful. But not anymore. Knowing that the coronavirus spreads like aerosol droplets that come from our mouth and our nose, the source of our breath, I don't care if you are God, I don't want anyone breathing on me ever again. Keep your breath to yourself, God. The coronavirus has changed so much in our lives. We are recording this service in early April where the death count here in the United States has already crossed 13,000 people. I can't imagine by the time we watch this service together on May 3rd what that count will look like. We send our deepest sympathies to the friends and family of every person who has been affected by this pandemic we express so much gratitude to the doctors and nurses and physician assistants and respiratory therapists and lab techs and custodians and food service providers and scientists, emergency responders and police officers, everyone on the front lines who is putting their own life at risk to help all of us. I know there are so many industries I didn't even mention, but we thank you, all of you, we pray daily for people who work in restaurants and salons and retail and hotels, the many small business owners who are struggling during this time of closures and economic downturn. We pray that all of you will be sustained until we reach the end of this crisis. We pray for all the parents juggling work and kids, for older adults who are cut off from their families, for everyone who has had to delay doctor's visits and surgeries, we know how difficult this has been. Our country has had to change the way we do school and work, how we eat, how we worship together. When the pandemic first started, Jen and I put out a digital devotion talking about how it's not just the changes on a large scale, but also the small changes that have affected us. 
and that we have had to grieve their loss. On those small scales, you know, it's been almost two months now, and so 15% of us have had to celebrate birthdays and anniversaries in quarantine. Students haven't been able to see their friends at school. College students were sent home to miss recitals and performances and commencement. Just as Jen and I canceled a Strickland family trip to Hawaii, I know that many of you were planning trips and vacations and getaways for years that have now been canceled. Sporting events and concerts and festivals all canceled. Farmers markets, parties, dinners, family gatherings, happy hours all canceled. We had such grand plans for Good Friday and Easter and we had to cancel them and replan. I think one of the worst events right now that has had to be canceled or postponed is funerals. It is such an important part of the grieving process to gather together with those you love to remember the life of someone. And because we haven't been able to get together, that grief has been postponed. No matter how big or small the occasion, it is okay. It is necessary to allow ourselves to grieve that so much has been lost and changed. Scripture does a great job of holding the duality of change and planning and tension. Both the fact that we are inclined to make plans for the future, but also that those plans have to change, sometimes dramatically. The book of Acts follows the earliest disciples of Jesus who are trying to figure out how to share the good news of Jesus' resurrection with people all over the world. The problem is, is that these first Christians have no idea what church is yet. They don't know what they're supposed to do, and so they start talking about and writing. When they get together, should they sing songs? Should they eat a meal together? Just like we have had to change the way we pass the peace, no more shaking hands, the earliest Christians would write about, how should you greet another Christian to make sure you knew that both people were of the same faith? In Scripture, the Apostle Paul suggests giving each other a holy kiss. No way, not happening anymore. But they didn't even know whether there was something specific they should believe, a doctrine they had to adhere to, specific rules they should follow. There's no New Testament yet. The Gospels haven't been written. The letters of Paul haven't been written. They have no idea what it means to follow Jesus, and yet they're trying their best to make plans. In chapter 15, right before this, the very first church council is held. And they get the leaders of the church together and they try to discuss whether or not someone has to convert to Judaism first in order to be a follower of Jesus and follow all of the laws. At the end of the council, they decide, no, that's not necessary. It is okay to be a Gentile, meaning someone who was not Jewish, and in order to show their commitment to this idea, they send Paul on a special missionary journey to go into the Gentile world and to travel as far as he can to bring the good news of Jesus to other people. And so Paul starts out on this journey, and he is excited. He feels like this is exactly what he was called to do. And so he starts planning he puts together a whole travel itinerary to map out his route and where he's going to go and where he's going to stop. And first up is Asia. He's headed to the east. If you want a new quarantine activity, then you can read through the book of Acts. It is one of the most enjoyable books of the Bible to read through because it's one long travel log. But right away, in chapter 16, as Paul starts his journey... It is one changed plan or mishap or chaos, one right after the other. Paul starts going towards Asia, but then he feels strongly that the Holy Spirit is telling him to go in the opposite direction and change his plans. That's when he has the vision we read in our scripture passage today of a man from Macedonia, which is near present-day Greece, calling him to go there. So Paul feels like that's where he's supposed to go. He starts heading that way, and when he arrives to the city of Philippi, one of the largest cities in the region of Macedonia, it, is, it comes time for the Sabbath, and Paul wants to go find a place to pray. And so he goes to a place where he thinks he'll find a quiet place to pray, 
And when he's there, he meets a woman named Lydia, who is a dealer of purple cloth. As a side note, this text is trying to subtly tell us that Lydia made bank. A dealer of purple cloth would have been super wealthy. Purple cloth was rare. It was worn by royalty and other elites. So the fact that she dealt these fabrics meant that she had a lot of money. Paul thinks he's traveling to Asia, but God sends Paul in another direction. Paul thinks he's going to go find a quiet place to pray, but then he meets an entire household that he baptized and a woman who's probably behind the scenes going to fund his ministry work. Paul learns this day that he can't do his work alone. All of our work requires help. And as you keep reading... Paul thinks that God has grand things in store for him in Philippi, but then he helps a slave girl whose owners are upset, and Paul is beaten severely and thrown in prison for disturbing the peace. He's placed in stocks and held in the innermost cell to prevent any chance of escape. So Paul thinks he's going to be stuck in prison for a long time. But suddenly an earthquake comes and hits the prison and the doors fall apart and open up. The prison guard is afraid that he is going to lose his job. And so he starts to take his own life because he thinks there's no hope. But then Paul shares with him the good news of Christ. These are wild Tiger King level exploits here. Take a pause from Netflix and read through the book of Acts. We think we're going on vacation and then a pandemic hits. We think our kids are going to finish out their school year normally, but then a pandemic hits. We think we have the next three months at church all planned out, but then a pandemic hits. We think business is going great, and then a pandemic hits, and everything changes. Everything changes. I think we have all been amazed at how rapidly life has changed starting back in March. We watched as the news reported increased cases of coronavirus in China throughout early 2020, but I admit that I thought this would be fairly contained, just like the SARS epidemic before it. But then it started to spread to Iran and South Korea and Italy, and then the first case in Washington came, but I still did not think that any of this would change our daily lives. Then in a single evening, the NBA canceled its season, and Tom Hanks and Rita Wilson were tested positive for coronavirus, and we started to realize that something bigger was happening. By the very next morning, the governor of California said we could not gather in groups more than 250, and within a week's time, that dropped to 50 people, then 10 people, as long as you were six feet away, and then all of a sudden we were sheltering in place not leaving home unless we had to go to essential work or the grocery store. Suddenly, schools were shut down for the rest of the year. Everything changed so quickly. But what has been equally as amazing is how well everyone has adapted. Universities quickly went to virtual spaces. I read a great article that was talking about how students with disabilities have been asking for these kinds of accommodations for years and told they weren't possible. But when it came time to need them for other people, then they were possible. Universities could adapt. Churches are founded on the premise of coming together in person to worship together but we found that even when we couldn't be physically in the same space, church was so much bigger than buildings and we could keep nurturing our spiritual connections. We adapted hospitals where workers were on the front lines caring for those with the virus. They set up new wings of their hospital for coronavirus care. They were able to put together makeshift gowns and masks and figure out how to keep two people alive on the same ventilator. They should have never been in that position, but they were so resilient and they adapted. Parents who are now the source 
of their child's education during this time were able to figure out what to do. This isn't homeschooling. It's not virtual schooling. This is pandemic schooling. It's something completely different. Taking conference calls while unclothed kids run around, keeping everyone fed, helping young ones understand they can't leave the house and visit their grandparents. I know that some of you are barely surviving. We pray for you daily. But again, your resilience is so admirable. We have watched as people who would self-describe as technologically inept near Luddites have rolled up their sleeves and created Zoom accounts so they could join our church's Bible studies and discussion groups. You've made Facebook accounts so you could watch the live stream. Yes, we have had to mute many of your Zoom microphones because you didn't know how to do it and we could hear you talking in the background, but that's okay. We've adapted. During these dark times, we have all been inspired by stories of ordinary people sewing masks for their local hospitals, families putting teddy bears and rainbows and hearts in their windows, kids chalking sidewalks with inspiring messages, nurses flying to New York to help overwhelmed hospitals, techies with 3D printers printing parts for ventilators, 85-year-olds celebrating their anniversaries, by writing messages on signs and showing them through windows. We have pulled together to do whatever is necessary because that is what we do. We make plans, those plans change, and we adapt. The human spirit is resilient. And that is the reality of our faith. Our faith gives us the confidence to make plans but it also gives us the flexibility to trust that the Spirit of God can lead us in new directions at any time. And it gives us the assurance that no matter the challenge, no matter how dark our days might get, we can adapt, we can keep going, we can lift each other up. We are rooted in a faith that is thousands of years old that has come through pandemics and wars and famines and depressions and that has declared we need not lose hope for we will keep going. We have seen that in this church so many times. In 1928, Claremont UCC made plans to build a new part of our campus, what is known as the Guild Hall, our office building, we wanted to build it so that we could have a place for the wider community to gather. But then the Great Depression hit. The church could have lost hope, but instead they adapted. They figured out a way to still pool together their resources because they knew how important this was. And still today, that very building is used for nonprofits like the Foothill AIDS Project, 28 different support groups, Boy Scout and Girl Scout troops, classes for people with eating disorders, meetings to help rehouse the homeless, concerts for youth orchestras, seminars for empowering female leaders, every community group you can imagine. People know that if you need to gather post or pre-pandemic times, then you go to Claremont United Church of Christ. This is where we can come to do the work of the community. And you should know that even in pandemic times, this is where you come to get spiritually nourished. Two years ago, we had already put together our budget for the year and our whole mission plan when news came out that our government was separating children from their parents at the border and putting children in detention centers where they slept on cold floors without any soap or toothpaste. We could have said that we already had enough mission organizations we were partnering with. We could have said there was not enough money to go around. We could have said that we're going to focus on the Claremont Homeless Advocacy Program and the House of Ruth Shelter for Battered Women and that we were going to stick close to home. But we knew that we could do both. We knew we didn't have to choose. We knew that we had to do something. You all were resilient. And so we came together and we had thousands of toys and hygiene items and clothes that we brought to a facility in Laverne that had unaccompanied minors from the border. We put together groups to go to the Adelanto Detention Center to visit asylum seekers in person. 
And when naturally we connected with those people, you raised money to bond two young men out of detention and you brought them into your homes for meals. You gave them the clothes and resources they needed. You drove them to appointments and helped them get bicycles. We adapted to meet the needs of others. In March 2019, the church was preparing for its stewardship season just like we're doing right now. And Pastor Jen and I were putting together our list of goals for the year. And we wrote down as one of our goals that we wanted to start a live stream. And so last year, you started a new budget line item for technology. Well, I am so glad we did that. We're using it right now. It's getting us through this pandemic. I'm glad that the church adapted and approved a new spending line for our live stream. And then we used those funds back in December to purchase a 4K video camera and a light ring. Pastor Jen and I said, hey, you know what? We should start doing some digital devotions sometime when we have the time for it. Well, the time was now. And I am glad that those resources were there because this church was able to adapt. We didn't anticipate that this year our pledge season would be coming during the middle of a pandemic. We know that for some of you, your unemployment or your employment situation is very uncertain and causing a lot of anxiety right now. We want you to know again that this church is always here to support you in anything, anything that you need. Please come to us. And even though everything is changing and being canceled, the church is not canceled. We will not go anywhere. God is still using this church and us and you to bring more hope and love to this world. And while we have been entrusted to care for this beautiful space, we also know that church is so much bigger than that and it is where we go, wherever we go. As we have said, we have so many plans and dreams for the year ahead from hiring a full-time director of children, youth, and families to finally installing our handicapped access ramp on our Harrison Street parking lot to starting a new program to help those who are food insecure in our neighborhoods. Uh, we know that these are our plans. And as we set our budget for next year, we only make plans based on the amount of resources we know are pledged from people of this church. So we do hope that you will take a moment to go on the website and submit your pledge on our website or contact our financial administrator or mail in your pledge card. We will make plans. But we also know that we will adapt and be ready as a church no matter what comes our way in the year ahead. And as we adapt, we will always proclaim an inclusive message of God's love for all people year after year, no matter pandemic or not. And like Paul, we will be ready to go wherever the Spirit leads us. And we hope you will join us. Amen. Please join in singing our hymn for this stewardship season as we ask God, be now our vision.
church, we adapt. And we adapt here at the communion table. I sure will miss the home-baked bread we have every month from Wendy Anson. But we know that communion is celebrated in so many different ways across the world. It's not always bread, but sometimes naan or pita. Today we have cherry chocolate chip cookies that Jen <laughs> baked for us. And we hope at home that you have gathered something to eat and something to drink because we can celebrate the great gift of Christ's love for us no matter what we put on our plate or in our cup. And so we will come to this communion table today to celebrate this gift. Friends, join me in prayer. Christ Jesus, you gathered around tables like this one with sinners and saints, with respected religious leaders and with outcasts, with the proud and the arrogant, and with the self-loathing and uncertain, the rich and the poor, the healthy and the sick, the young and the old. As we accept your invitation to join you at this table today, we remind you that we remind each other that when we are gathered in spirit, even distance really cannot separate us. Remind us that you are present here in our midst and that in this meal and in this worship, we can feel the joy that is community, the peace that you offer, and the presence that is your Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, on the night of his arrest, our Lord Jesus took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant, which is sealed in my blood. Whenever you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. And so, friends, as often as we eat this bread and we share this cup together in whatever time and place we are in, we celebrate the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus until he comes again in glory. From your homes, please help us keep the feast. Is that a bug? Thank you so much. Is that a fly? Okay. Amen. Friends, let us pray. Living, resurrected Christ, we remember how Mary and Joseph looked forward to the day of your birth, how shepherds and magi knelt before you in wonder, how the hearts of Anna and Simeon leapt in anticipation, and how your disciples and the crowds placed all their hope in you. We remember the vision of the future that was shattered by your crucifixion a time of suffering and pain and disillusionment. We remember how your disciples began to doubt you and questioned everything you had promised. We remember how the tomb was empty three days later, how the angel told the women of something unbelievable, how your followers could scarcely hope that the news was true. And we remember how you appeared to them in all your glory, in the garden, in the upper room, on the road to Emmaus, on the shores of Galilee. We remember how you gave your people new hope, a new vision, and a new dream for the future because you brought forth new life from the depths of death and loss. Holy Jesus, our world is waiting, hurting, longing, searching for hope, crying out for meaning, hungry for some reason to believe in the future. Come again in your living divine power and bring new life to all. We pray this morning using the words you teach us, saying together, our creator who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Church, there are so many times when we feel as if we are with Jesus in the tomb and darkness has settled over the land. But I also know that just like the historical church, we too are resilient and we will adapt to changing times and we will continue to proclaim the great message of Christ's love for all people. And so in these times, and in the year ahead and forever, may you go in the peace of Christ, knowing a love that never changes. Amen.